for two months we've been trying to get in contact with Congress people who voted nay to certain of the bills that were supported uh, by APEC, but um, nobody wanted to speak to us. Is that normal? Yeah, this is an issue where a congressperson will see no gain to be made by speaking on it. Just even voting uh, against APAC's recommended positions is, is perilous for them because it can lead to a reduction in campaign funds. It can create all kinds of problems in their home district. But they voted nay. I mean, they did. Um, but they don't want to go even more public about it. Uh, a film clip in particular, can you imagine a campaign opponent uh, using that? It could become the basis of a, of a um, negative campaign ad. And uh, look, this person is against Israel's interest. Uh, so when I, whenever I have spoken to people on Capitol Hill about this, it's almost always on a not for attribution basis. I was told off the record once by a very prominent democratic senator. We were at a meeting in Paris and it was late in the evening, we were sitting in a hotel, he was talking about the Middle East and he was saying things about Israel which were very similar to the criticisms that I would make. And so I said to him, but you never say these things in the Senate, why not? Is it because you're worried about the Jewish vote? He said, forget it, it's nothing to do with the Jewish vote. I come from a state, I can't tell you where, because otherwise, um, where there are very few Jews, and they're all going to vote for me anyway, so it doesn't matter. So it's not the Jewish vote, that's not the issue. It's not money, I don't get money from the Israel lobby, that's not the issue. But he said, suppose that I walk onto the Senate floor and say in a moving speech why we need to take our distance from Israel, and understand better what has happened to the Palestinians. Maybe I would win five, ten senators over to a, a general motion criticizing Israel, maximum. He said, but that's all I could get. And he said, in return, I would be finished in the Senate because no one would ever vote again for my needs if I wanted to move something for my state or an education bill or a financial bill or a tax bill or anything to do with domestic policy, nothing to do with Israel. I would be punished. I bet that it's impossible for either Steve or I to ever uh, get a high-level policy-making position in uh, the American government. Uh, for example, Steve was invited uh, to go to a dinner with an aspiring presidential candidate at Harvard. And the person who had invited Steve to this dinner came to see Steve about a week after the piece came out and she said that she had to disinvite him from the dinner because the presidential candidate's staff had called and said that it would not be acceptable for the presidential candidate to be at a dinner with him. America and Israel have a special friendship. You have devoted yourselves to strengthening the bonds between the United States and Israel. The United States will stand with Israel now and forever. If a, a politician would rise with this point of view that the United States should stop supporting uh, Israel, what would be the effect, do you think? He'd lose the next election, almost certainly. Now, there may be a district here or there uh, out of the... We have 435 members of the House and 100 senators, 535. We have 52 governors. Um, it's certainly possible that some congressional district somewhere would re-elect a candidate who had said we should abandon Israel, reject the relationship with Israel. Um, but it's, it's pretty unlikely, and I would be surprised if there are more than two or three or four congressional districts in which it's even conceivable. I appreciate but we can vote you. That's and I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> but I appreciate, but I appreciate the friendship. Come, if you will come in Italy, I want to introduce you in a member of a parliament, Italian parliament. I would enjoy that very much. Okay. Well. Thank, sure. you, Thank you for everything.
Friends owe it to friends to be as candid as possible. So let me say that a precipitous American withdrawal from Iraq would be a disaster for the United States and the entire Middle East. A sudden withdrawal of our coalition would dissipate much of the effort that's gone into fighting the global war on terror and result in chaos and mounting danger. And for the sake of our own security, we will not stand by and let it happen. I would argue that had you not had uh, all of these neoconservatives prominently placed inside the Bush administration, uh, that Colin Powell would have never ended up uh, giving that disgraceful uh, presentation in early February 2003 that played such a critical role in turning American public opinion. This is an important day for us all as we review the situation respe with respect to Iraq and its disarmament obligations under UN Security Council Resolution 1441. I realized as I watched it there at the UN Security Council for the first time, because every time I watched it before, I was, you know, running around trying to get things changed, do this, do that, talking about the graphics and everything else. But there in the UN Security Council, I sat down quietly and watched Secretary Powell make his presentation. My colleagues, every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These are not assertions. What we're giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence. As I show you these images, I will try to capture and explain what they mean, what they indicate to our imagery specialists. Let's look at one. The four that are in red squares represent active chemical munitions bunkers. I wouldn't go to war based on that. That's what I told myself. I would not go to war based on that. that was, most of it could be interpreted different from the way we were presenting it. As these drawings, based on their description, show, we know what the fermenters look like. We know what the tanks, pumps, compressors, and other parts look like. And we know a great deal about the platforms on which they are mounted. I walked outside the United Nations building on February the 5th after the presentation had been made into the kind of bracing, cold New York air, and I thought it, it was a total failure. Um, I thought I had failed because I was the person who put it together, responsible for putting it together. Then later, a couple of days later, three days later or so, when I'd had some sleep and I could think about it, um, I wondered why the reaction seemed to be fairly positive. I mean, we hadn't persuaded that many people who were adamantly opposed, but we had made some impact, uh, particularly on the American people. And I think we made a little impact on the international community, too, probably in the U.K. in particular. And so I realized the reason for that. And the reason was Colin Powell gave the presentation. Colin Powell, who had poll ratings roughly equivalent with Mother Teresa, had made the presentation. And the American people believed Colin Powell. If Colin Powell said it was so, then it was so. That made me feel even worse. Um, so, yes, I, I have trouble sometimes sleeping at night thinking about my participation in it. The quantities were vast. Less than a teaspoon of dry anthrax, a little bit about this amount. This is just about the amount of a teaspoon. Less than a teaspoon of dry anthrax. Shut down. So the question you have to ask yourself is if the evidence was so flimsy, why did Powell get up and make an unequivocal, such an unequivocal case that Iraq had WMD and was an imminent threat? And the reason is that there was tremendous pressure inside and outside the administration to make that argument. And the question is, who was creating that pressure? And the answer is it was the neoconservatives, almost single-handedly.